Okay, so let's crack on. So thanks, guys, for, for uh, joining us. Um, a bit disappointing the numbers, but you guys turned up, so thanks for that. So quick introduction to John then. So John's been a, a leading expert in AI, artificial intelligence, um, as well as disruptive technology. He's been a senior advisor to governments, global corporations, and was himself a senior advisor at McKinsey as well as a best-selling author on the, the subject of disruptive technology in his book, I Disrupted. A little plug for the book there, John. So, John, so that we don't get confused with AI and the kind of software information side and, you know, um, um, robots running through Oxford Street with laser weapons, what's today's focus going to be on? What's today's focus going to be on, John? So um, what I'm going to do is, is split this into two parts. Um, I'm going to describe how AI works in a completely non-technical environment. Um, so you're not going to get confused by anything along those lines. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to provide some generic examples of how AI is actually now already in everybody, everybody's everyday lives. You just don't notice AI being, being there. And some of these are pretty bloody amazing. Um, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a look at the construction industry and how AI will actually affect it. And the way that I've done that is I split it into two parts, what I describe as being upstream and downstream. Upstream is those people that contribute, like the architects, the planners, the quantity surveyors, they will all be affected by AI. Right. Downstream are the estate agents, uh, the mortgage brokers, the, the interior designers, they will equally be affected by AI. But for the cynics Excellent. amongst you, right, there will <laughs> be some changes directly in construction for the larger firms, not necessarily for the smaller firms. That's what I'm going to try and deal with. This is completely non-technical uh, discussion. Fantastic. OK, John, that's brilliant. Absolutely great. So there's a number of people on this call. You've just touched on it. There. There's a number of people on this call that simply do not believe that AI will impact the construction industry. So I've got a view on that, which I'll keep to myself. But my opening question to you is around the pace of this technological change. Up until recently, mankind, generic, neutral term, obviously, mankind has developed technology and moved at a varying pace throughout this kind of um, various evolutions. Are we at the stage now where we're about to see rapid change because AI itself is behind it. In other words, is technology now developing technology? Yes, in a word. Um, I've never seen anything like this. I've been in tech for 40 years. I have never seen exponential growth even remotely like this. Um, but you're correct in what you say, technology developing technology. AI is currently developing itself and doing it on again on an exponential basis. And I'll give you an example of um, how this is going to affect us. So at the moment, AI is fairly crude, although if you use chat GPT, you'd be amazed how good actually it is. Um, the real trick, um, as per the Terminator thing, is when AI becomes self-aware. Um, mm. Economists did a survey about th with 350 AI uh, experts. Uh, this was four years ago. And the mean uh, the mean or the main average there of when they expected AI to be truly human intelligence by 2066. They did the same survey six months ago that has now dropped down to 2033. So we wow. will expect true human-like intelligence from machines in 10 years' time. But the progression in between time is also going to be massive as well. And it wow, will be. Fuck me. So when I said about robots and laser guns running down Oxford Street, the only bit I missed really was yet. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So keeping in mind our audience join typically in construction and trades. You know, I think the question everyone's going to be asking is, how is this technology going to affect their business, right? And I would imagine there's a lots of lots of challenges ahead. So, without further ado, I will shut up and hand over to you, John, and uh, take it away. Okay, so um, let me just um, reprise a little bit there, Stu, and talk about uh, Terminator wandering wandering through Elgin City Centre with a laser with a laser gun. Um, I'm not concerned by that. Um, I think there's guardrails that we can put in there. What I am concerned is a breakdown of trust, um, because as we have more and more lookalikes coming into the marketplace via bad players around, for example, fraud, it's going to be really, really difficult over the next two or three years and become more difficult for us to actually tell the difference between an AI twin 
um, and an, and a real person. And that that really is actually terrifying. OK, yeah, so let me just show a few um, uh, screens. Let me just stop your screen there, Stu. And here we go. You should be able to share. That's it. OK, you can see that. So um, let me just put that into PowerPoint mode. Yeah, OK, into full so I'm going to talk about, about AI. Yeah, I'm going to talk about AI and property and construction. Um, but before I do it, I'm going to explain what it is. Um, now, just to repeat this, this is not going to be a technical discussion. I'm going to try and explain how it works in a very, very simplified format. Um, so let me just go into that. Now, what AI is particularly good at at this moment in time is high speed pattern recognition. Now, for some of you with young kids, you actually might get to notice this because this is something oh, bear with me there we are this is sort of something called where's wally um and this is how ai works so the the idea of where's wally is you come home from work you want to share a bottle of wine with your wife and you give this child your child a challenge and the challenge is is you describe to them that wally is a little guy with a red and white striped jumper and black frizzy hair now the way that we would approach finding him this cartoon is that mentally the human brain will divide this into a yeah. grid and we will go looking for patterns there. So in this case, what actually happens, this is a particularly difficult one, because this cartoon has got lots of false positives in it. So there's a little guy down the right-hand corner, red white stripe jumper, brown frizzy hair. Little guy on the left-hand side, right middle, right, is red white stripe jumper, blonde frizzy hair. So this is quite difficult. Wally in himself is right dead center in the screen. Okay, so Google looked at this concept and 10 years ago, they said to themselves, I want to be able to identify a cat through parts of a cat in a moving YouTube video. So this was the, the object that they set themselves. And this is, oops, there we go. That's it. Um, this is 10 years ago. They managed to identify a cat at 98% accuracy versus 96% accuracy for human beings. That was 10 years ago. We are now in a scenario where it's being able to process so fast that we're starting to see everyday usage actually occur, except for the fact you won't see it. So let me give you a couple of examples of that. So everybody knows that Netflix is getting better at generating more reliable um, movies and series than Hollywood does. It seems to be able to actually generate them on a more reliable basis. And by reliable, I actually mean audience acceptance. So how they've done it is really interesting. Um, so this, let me give you an example. I was talking to a Netflix exec a couple of years ago, and I said, how do you get this reliability? And he said, well, take a series like uh, The Crown, which was universally, everybody thought it was absolutely brilliant. And he said, we know when you pause fast forward, we know when you watched it, we know the date, the time that you watched it, we know where you watched it, we know what you searched for beforehand, we know what you searched for afterwards. He said, we build a picture. He said, let me give you an example. He said, let's say in series two, episode three, 27,000 people put it on pause in 11 minutes. Of that, 11, so three minutes later, 8,000 people came back and stopped the replay. We can assume from that 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 part was boring. So he said, we take that pattern recognition, we build it into our AI uh, capability, and every time a new script comes in from somebody, we scan it through that to find out what the boring bits may look like. So as you actually, as you watch Netflix, AI is sitting in the background, actually making sure that the stuff that you're actually watching has actually got some level of depth to it. Um, so this is interesting as well. I mean, I think that um, there's a there's a skills the skills crisis in the construction industry which will be solved by AI. Um, this was an, an article a couple of months ago um, about 58% of organisations trying to hire the skill they need. Let me just dip back into a second here to give some more examples of how it is in everyday, and then I'll talk to, talk about in construction. So new AIs are generally now reckoned to be 90%. Oh, that's you got my. Uh, that's pull up on screen. Just New put AI a call out here, John. Just a right? quick question to ask people now in the call. Will AI be able to build houses? So get let's let's see what the audience say before you actually reveal the answer. So everybody on the call, the, the question is, will AI be able to build houses? You've got three choices. No chance, dude. Or maybe, but not soon. And yes, and they don't throw sickies. 
So what, let, let's everybody get an answer in there, um, and you know, and, and let's see what the audience thinks before before John actually um, reveals the answer to that. So will AI be able to build houses? The answers are no chance, dude. Maybe not soon, no. And yes, and they won't throw sickies. Now, John, this is really interesting, right? Because so far, and this is a, I've got to be honest, this is a complete polar opposite of what I was expecting. Nobody has answered no chance, dude. Mm. Right? 29% have said, yeah, maybe, but not soon. And 71% are sitting just now saying yes, and they won't throw sickies. Now, admittedly, it's maybe they won't throw sickies, but it's attracted them to that answer. But that's really interesting because the previous conversations that I had was more of a, not a denial, that's the wrong word to use, but more of a, no, that this won't happen, won't happen in my lifetime. So that's really, really interesting. So it appears to well, be that the people on the call, the bulk are saying yes. So the reason for that is very likely chat GPT. Because nobody really heard of AI amongst the general public, general builders, general construction until six months ago when ChatGPT came out. And then all of a sudden, everybody's talking about AI. So I think that the, the level of confidence is a direct result of the press coverage it's getting. Let me just flip back into some, some more examples, Stu, before I do start on the construction side. Um, uh, that is, let me just get, there we go. Okay, so new AIs right, are now more creative than 90% of human beings. And as a direct result of that, I don't know why this is switching screens. As a direct result of that, IKEA actually gave an AI a specific problem on designing a flat pack sofa, one that can be carried around. It took four minutes for it actually to actually work out this AI designed a couch that weighs 22 pounds and fits in an envelope. Now, you can imagine the amount of people that would be involved in this if it was a human enterprise. You'd have designers, you'd have uh, manufacturing capability uh, specialists, you'd have a whole range of people doing that. This took four minutes for it to work out how to actually do it. And we'll see some more examples of that in a little while. We've seen another example in Q8, an AI newsreader has been new reading the news for six months and nobody noticed it only as it came out, they actually announced that it was an AI. This is what I mean about AI coming into everybody's lives, actually without us noticing it. Chat GPT. So you're saying I could be a robot, nobody would notice. Yes. Well, not used to it. No, I can't imagine a robot being I'm able one to. One of a kind, don't I? <laughs> <laughs> um, Chat GPT. That's what we talk about. An AI-powered chatbot nearly passed its medical exams within two years. It'll have doctor doctor-like capability. Um, we saw this is in the Times uh, day before yesterday. This guy is using ChatGPT to generate a manifesto in an Alexa forthcoming uh, by-election so with the idea that he would become elected. And he's used AI to write his manifesto there, which is bloody incredible. So let wow. me now dip into AI in construction. So let me talk a little bit here about what I would describe as being the stack. Now, where I come from in technologies, we call, call something a full stack. If you take construction in the middle, we've got upstream and we've got downstream. So upstream is the architects. It's the, uh, let me try and get this poll thing out of the way. Um, it's the surveyors or the quantity surveyors, and it's the town planners. Those are the people that make construction happen. Then downstream, you've got the estate agents, You've got the mortgage operators and you've got the interior designers. AI is going to affect both sides of that equation. But I'm also going to show you how AI robotics will actually affect the, the construction industry as well. So let's talk about upstream for starters. Um, global survey, 1900 large and small businesses in Europe commissioned by a robotics firm. 91 percent of respondents say they will face a skills crisis in the next next 10 years. 44% indicate they are currently struggling to recruit people. It's my view that AO, AI robotics will change that and they'll change the economics of the business. The big house builders, the ones doing 100 at a time, they have got the capital to be, in, to be able to employ this new generation of robots. But that what will happen is that will release more people into the marketplace to help the small house builders actually do so. So I think here, Everybody will win. And we'll come on to that a little bit while I'll give you an example of it. 
And this is classically, this, this is a reflection of what you just <laughs> asked. This was a Belgium advertising agency um, specialising in construction. Bob Hobbs, it said, hey, Jack PT, finish this building. Well, it will be added to. So let's talk, let's look at about robots on the building site. Now, that hitherto, it's generally be considered that robots are not dexterous enough and not intelligent enough to be able to take somebody's job. I think that we can challenge that. This is uh, Boston Dynamics from the US. This is a robot which is intelligent, has AI, and it's very dexterous. Let me just show you what it can do. Wow. That's pretty amazing stuff. And they are building more and more of these robots. That robot costs £100,000, uh, 100, pounds, not dollars. Well, £100,000, if you imagine that, if you're paying a builder £30,000 a year, that's three years worth. But this thing works 24 by 7 and throws no sickies mm. and requires no holidays. So actually, it probably pays for itself in about a year and a half. So I think in the next two or three years, we will start to see this level of robotics appearing on the major building sites, right? Even if it's just for load carrying. Another example of that is in the, the US military um, is now using robots to actually carry ammunition to frontline troops. And these are AI robots. And they're capable, like this robot here, of negotiating various types of surfaces. So this technology now exists and now exists effectively. So the next so thing... ask a question, because um, yeah. you obviously involve quite a lot with uh, investments and um, you know, you know, economics um, at a fairly um, substantial scale. All, all this AI is fantastic, right? You can, you can see that the 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 massive benefits, you know, being able to work in a building site seven days a week, 24 hours a day. Here's a question for you, though. Where, where do the humans go? Um, so the, the humans in the, the humans on the building site or the, the workers on the building site, they I think they'll end up in the smaller construction companies because the smaller construction companies for the next five or six years aren't capitalized enough to be able to afford, to be able to uh, afford those robots. But like everything else in tech, you know, it, ex it increases in power, increases in intelligence and then drops in price. So I think that's only a seven year window. Um, <laughs> The answer to, if you're looking at the bigger question, what happens to humanity or what happens generally to jobs, then uh, this is quite an interesting one. I don't think jobs are at risk, but I think tasks within jobs are going to be dramatically changed. Um, and I think the example, this is the example here. So AI and the architects, Rob, there are several packages, AI packages out now that you can simply say, design me a beach house with three bedrooms. And four minutes later, it comes back and gives you a, a, a beach house with three bedrooms that you can then change. Well, that would take an architect quite a long time to be able to do it. And then you've got the quantity surveyors to be able to do that as well. And I'll show you that. I'll show you this example in a second. What you're about to see here um, is bollocks. Um, this is a this is a video that I picked up on YouTube done by quantity surveying software business. Let's just have a quick look at it. At present, we perform roles such as preparing bill of quantities, raising compensation events or variations of final accounting for works. The creation and compiling of these documents can and will most likely be automated. An intelligent computer will be able to take off all the relevant quantities and prepare a bill of quantities from the design in less time with next to no errors. We as quantity surveyors simply can't compete with those type of tasks. But our jobs will remain relevant and will remain important. And here's why. A lot of our job is human focused. Extracting value from a project in the planning phase requires a lot of communication and coordination between a quantity surveyor and the other consultants who work at design or delivery. Assisting a client to pick out the best value tender from a group requires excellent negotiation skills. Developing a high level cost plan based on only 25% of the documentation requires EQS not only to understand the project with limited information, but to reach out to the client and subcontractor to find out exactly what they want and how we can assist. Like we said before, a lot of our role is human-based. This includes having good communication, negotiation, advising, and relationship-building skills. Do we think AI will affect our role as a quantity surveyor? 
Yes, we believe it will. Will it replace the role of the quantity surveyor? No, we don't think that will happen. And that is bollocks. And the reason why it's bollocks is this. Um, is fundamentally what's going on here is that we as human beings, only 10% of what we talk about, when we talk to each other, we're only using about 10% of our brain. We have 90% is tacit information, right? Stuff that we know, we know that we don't necessarily are going to bring into a conversation. So that's part number one. But part number two is the reason why quantity surveyors jobs will go in the next 10 years is because of the fact that AIs will talk to other AIs. So, you know, quantity surveyors AI will talk to an architect's AI, which talk to a planner's AI, right? And what we're talking about here is we're talking about the interconnection. I'll give you an example of this, and that is this. So about uh, three or four months ago, um, Stanford University got together with Google and they put a bunch of robots into AI robots into a room, gave them something to talk about. One of the other robots actually asked one of them out for a cup of coffee, right, without actually seeing it. So it wasn't aware of its physical capability. So this is how they're going to actually end up as connecting to each other. So then we've got downstream and we've got downstream is will a station be replaced by robots? I have absolutely no no issue with that at all. I think in the next three to four years, they will actually be able to do that. They'll negotiate. They'll talk to your robot. They'll talk to your, your Alexa device when you're looking for a house. Right. It will start to actually understand what you're looking for. It will take into many different, many different things into account, like weather conditions that you like, you know, what sort of car you drive, the stuff that state agents don't have the bandwidth to be able to do. So, yes, I do think. John, John, can I just add something here that I've just noticed here, which I find quite fascinating is that bottom line where it says uh, a 2013 yeah. study, a 10-year-old yeah. study by Oxford University estimated that AI has a 98% chance of yeah. replacing estate agents. Having dealt with estate agents, my next question is, when? Why is when? It yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it is one of the early jobs like lawyers that will be replaced very, very rapidly. Nathan said the exact um, same thing. So, He's put a chat. Yes, yeah. can we speed that one up, please? <laughs> so then you've got AI and interior design as well. This is where the interior designers will go, because the simple fact is, is that AI can think about more things than ever a designer can. And it actually knows, it'll work out what people actually like, what your own individual tastes will actually be as well. So then you've got, I don't think you can actually see that. Let's just go to the next slide. AI and mortgages, uh, the impact of co uh, conversational AI mortgage lending. This will be where AI bots will actually take over for, for the, from the mortgage lender. I absolutely see this one happening very, very rapidly because AI can make information on credit scores. You know, it can it can work out what your affordability is, right? Where you're actually buying, what the projected value of the house might be in five or ten years out of time. The stuff that mortgage brokers simply can't do at this moment in time. So they are another one that's actually going to get changed as well. The bottom line of all of this, AI is here, it's going to get smarter and it's going to be everywhere. And it's going to be everywhere a lot earlier than people think. It's gonna affect the construction industry at the top line, in other words, the upstream, and the bottom and the and the, the bottom line, in other words, the downstream, right? It's also for the larger players going to actually change the economics of the construction industry. They will be able to actually afford those robots, the one you've just seen, but that will release more workers, skilled workers, to the lower end of the marketplace, those people actually doing four or five houses at a time. So I do see significant benefit here to the whole housing industry on both sides of the coin, the small economics and the large economics of it. That's it. Well, shall we do? Okay. Um, shall we do questions? Interesting stuff. Um, yeah, let me just go back in, share the screen. So, um, yeah, that was really interesting, John. So, we'll open up for questions. We just open up the chat box first of all. Um, see if anyone's put any chat in. Um, okay, that's an interesting one. Um, Derek's kicked off one here. What? Jobs have already been made fully redundant by AI. So don't think jobs, think tasks. Um, I don't know any jobs that have been fully made redundant by AI. Um, but if you go back in time, you know, you go back to when the first world processors came out, you know, it's decided that the secretaries actually wouldn't actually be in those jobs anymore. They just morphed. Right. They morphed into much more general administration rather than just typing. So 
what technology does is it breeds more opportunities but think about the tasks think about the quantity surveyor who's, or the architect who's actually been asked to actually devise a house well actually what it will do is it will take a lot of that tasking away from them freeing them up to be more creative before the ai catches up from a creativity point of view mm -hmm. so tasks will change job roles will change but i don't think it's going to be a major issue over employment where the major issue comes really in about 10 or 15 years time when ai has become truly intelligent we don't have an economic or a political structure that can even come close to actually dealing with that so anybody who's sitting here knows their local mp you need to go badger them quite heavily human beings have never seen anything like this and we are in for a period of massive disruption in about 10 or 15 time 10 years time hopefully i will be dead by that particular point but it's the kids <laughs> you've now got to worry about no absolutely the thing is though john we, we talked about this before in a previous um uh, presentation where the only thing likely to slow AI down, and correct me if I'm wrong here, the only thing likely to slow AI down is our acceptance of it. I, I saw a cartoon that illustrated this where the, the top cartoon was people of um, our age, so 50 plus, right, that were, were, were getting onto a jet and they were, they were, they were turning off because the, the stewardess had said, um, today's flight is being conducted by AI. And the older couple were walking off going, oh, no, flying the plane without a pilot. Then the next cartoon was a younger couple that were walking off the jet. And the stewardess was at the top saying, today's, today's flight has been conducted by humans. And the younger the younger couple were saying, I'm not flying in a plane with a human's pilot on it. Does that mean then that the biggest issue we've got with, with the pace of AI is our acceptance, our reluctance, whereas our kids will just take it like that? Well, the kids are going to take it like that anyway, because they'll immediately see the benefits. But what I said earlier on is, you know, when you talk about somebody getting onto a plane and being told that AI is going to actually fly the plane, no, no airline's going to do that. Um, what they will do is their their air, their aerodynamic, their aeronautic systems, their navigation systems will be taken by AI. So what I was talking about AI earlier on, it's actually getting into people's lives without people actually knowing about it. So we're not going to make a conscious decision as to whether or not we want AI to actually be in our lives. If you've got an Alexa device, you've already got it. If you've got an iPhone with Siri, right, you, know, um, you know, it's yeah, just because true. more advanced. Um, I think the other thing, just in preemption of a, of a question here, um, it was asked in the Times about three or four weeks ago, you know, how would we stop AI? Well, I've got news. You can't. And the reason why you can't mm. is because AI sits an application layer above the internet. The internet is designed to be fault tolerant and reductive. And I remember re redundant. I remember seeing somebody's letter about that saying, we just bomb the data centers, fucking moron. Right. As soon as you bomb the data centers, there's going to be somewhere, another data center that takes because of the fact that it's actually, it's fully redundant and it's fully, um, it, it's it, it's toughened, right? The only way you could kill it is if you kill the whole planet or you actually kill the energy supplies, which a new could actually do. So I don't see any of, of, of stopping this. Nor do I want so to. So a couple of comments here. Um, Derek's put up seeing a friend of his works for a, uh, as a defence specialist who, who works on AI military unmanned drones. Remember we met the guys, John, with the, the drones up here in Lost Mouth as well. And uh, Derek's comment is is Skynet here already. Yeah, I think it, I think it is. Jonathan's asked a really interesting question here though. This all sounds far too scary, and yes, it is, and too soon. We're all going to be slaves to them. How will we be able to compete long term as a race? We can't. Um, and I'll oh, give you shit. an okay. I wasn't expecting that. Okay. Thanks, John. That's all right. So um, Alan Turing, uh, the father of modern computing, no, sorry, um, Stephen Hawking, turned around and basically said, when something which is technology that's actually data, right, accelerates itself, it's going to actually pass us by because we are biological. We've evolved over millions and millions of years. These things are self, 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 self teaching. Where I think the human race will actually end up is I think that we'll be sitting in our sofa on our sofas actually you know immersed in call of duty you know in apple's new headset with ai playing it and we won't know the difference between what the real world is what the virtual world is powered by ai powered by graphics so i think that our life will become much more enjoyable in about 60 years time 
The difficulty is, is the gap between now and 60 years time. We don't know how to cope with this. And I'll give you another example of this. So let's talk about bananas. So in the UK, we throw away 1.5 million bananas every day because we, sh we, we, we ship the wrong bananas, the wrong amount of bananas to the wrong place at the wrong time at the wrong cost. Now, imagine that if you've got biodegradable sensor on the banana, which now exists, the banana talks to your smart fridge. The smart fridge talks to your supermarket. The supermarket talks to its supply chain. All of a sudden, you start to ship bananas in the right quantity at the right time at the right price. No wastage. But the problem with that, mm -hmm. nobody makes any money because my, people make money out of friction. Right. As a direct result of that, the current economic models as we actually stand don't work. Right. So in so the gap between we've now got between as we are now and having this amazing existence in 60 years time where nobody has to work. We don't need money. Um, you know, food is plentiful. You know, we live to 250 years old gene editing and all of those other things that go with it. We just got to get through the next 60 years. And as I say, I'm very delighted to be actually dead by that particular point. Yeah, I think I'll struggle to get through the next 60 years, John, if I'm honest. <laughs> in case Perry's oh, not one smell too good. So, and here's one that, that, that this was American. This was a, this was a, a, a Californian firm that put this up. So, um, at the time I took it with a pinch of salt, I, I stuck it onto the WhatsApp group, um, really just to throw in a social hand grenade to see what the thought was. It thought was, but this um, this firm in the states in California had said that the, the technology is here, right here, right now, being used. And the example was around um, architects and quantity surveyors, right? Where AI is able to sit down with the client and already access, you know, billions of data entries. So they'll 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 know what your what your likes are, what your preferences are, what colours you like, what styles you like. And within a very short period of time from the from the questionnaire that you give it, it will design your perfect house. Yeah. But it's also able to access instantly all the building regs, right? Yeah. All the legislation surrounding the, the building in whatever area you're going to build. So when it designs the house for you, it's going to make sure it's compliant. And it's going to do that in seconds, right? And then the, the thing that got me really interested when it comes to what's called a takeoff in the building industry, which is obviously you calling out all the materials, it's able to do that to the most effective, um, not just from a cost point of view, but also from an efficiency point of view as well. It'll know exactly what timbers you need, bricks, blocks, everything, cement right down to the nearest kilo. Plus, it'll also be able to access every builder's merchant within a radius and access the prices. So it's buy, it buys the best, but it doesn't just buy the best, it buys who can deliver on time as well. So I looked at that and thought, well, that sounds plausible, but is that here already, John? Yeah, fundamentally. What they've got to do is they've just got to stitch the systems together so that the quantity surveyor's information will actually talk to the architect's information, which will then talk to the planner's information. But we've already seen that. This is something called an API, um, where these, these systems will actually talk to each other. Um, you know, and, and every day, you know, every time you go on, on something on Amazon, you would not believe the amount of information they're actually picking up on you. And their AI systems are actually just about to start delivering in the States something called shop in a box. And what shop in a box is when you order something from Amazon, they look at people like you and what they've ordered before and the other things that go in. And what they do is they actually ship a big box with other stuff that you might like that they work out what you should do. And if you don't like some of the stuff, you send back the box. Well, you can imagine the average revenue per user. I mean, you know, for, you and I, for the technology stuff, they deliver a box full of four or five different technology items. Chances are I'm going to keep three or, five, three or five of them. And they've done that because they're able to profile, think forward, and their AI systems can look at those packaging. It's all about the AI systems talking to each other. But this is in the domain of the big players. This is the Googles, the Facebooks, um, the Apples, right, because... To develop some of the AI systems, I mean, the chat GPT took $10 billion. So this is outside of the hands. So we are now at the mercy of the technology companies. Now, in the case of Apple, I'm quite, quite happy to actually do that. I'm not so happy in the case of Google, and I'm certainly not happy in the case of um, of Meta, aka, AKA Meta. Facebook. Oh, yes. How honest are they? Here, yeah. Here's a question, John, that's just been put up by Nathan, right? This is an interesting one. So as a structural engineer, civil engineer, AI 
has been available in the form of AI Rhino for design of structures. Nathan's looking to be an early adopter to implement in the workplace. Yeah. Can you offer advice on how best to implement? Um, I mean, when I looked around, I mean, there's a whole bunch of AI vertical packages that deal with stuff, um, you, you know, it, that's in the design process and stuff like that. I think if you want to get ahead of the game, you just got to do a lot of research to find out which are the best packages. In terms of, uh, in, in terms of giving you an edge, there's two things here. The first part is having selected those packages, you immediately will have a productivity edge over your competitors, which basically means that you're going to be more profitable. But the other thing you're going to have to make a decision on is whether or not you start to take tell your prospective clients that you're using AI. And this refers back to the plain scenario, because in my world, if you if, if I had an architect turn around and saying AI, bloody marvelous, right? I'm, I'm up, actually up for that. Whereas there will be other people it might put off. So I think it's going to be down to two things. You've got the productivity side, which remains unseen, but you've then got the decision is, do you actually surface this amongst your, amongst your clients? Because some of them are going to turn around and say, yeah, absolutely excellent idea. Some are going to turn around and say, no, but that will change. You know, as you talked about earlier on, about the younger people getting on a plane and saying, yeah, I actually want AI because I don't want a human pilot. That's going to become more pervasive. So over the next five to 10 years, if I were, oh, sorry, I don't, re don't remember the name. If I were doing that, I would absolutely now go ahead and select some of those packages to get ahead of your competitor. Because you get ahead now, you could well stay ahead for quite some quite considerable time. Yeah, absolutely. Interesting. OK, I'm just conscious of the time. We originally were starting at half five. I had told John it was half five. It was moved to six o'clock. So John had, had already made um, some uh, arrangements for a couple of minutes' time. So has anybody else, before we wrap up, has anybody else got any other questions they want to, to pose to John before he goes? Um, I mean, John's, you know, one of these uh, five, ten grand uh, a speech. So we've got, we've got some good talent here for for two thirds of fuck all, as they say. So take advantage of it. Take advantage of it. Is anybody get any questions for John? Either shout out or stick it in the chat box. Just say that for two thirds of fuck all, John. Um, great to meet you. Great to know you, and many thanks for your help. Um, amazing stuff. Really love it. Cheers. It is, and and you do, know, do you know what would be good, Derek? You know, as we, we get joined back in five or ten years' time, we, we compare notes of what's actually happened. Because I actually think that we're in for a period of you know absolute rapid, rapid change. Well, yeah. I'm on the waiting uh, list already for my bionic eye that's being fitted in four and a half years' time. So that'll be just after that. Yeah, and and to absolutely. Be if it if it if it didn't happen in eighteen months' time, I would actually be quite surprised. But Derek, you know there is a dark side to all of this, and if you knew what I knew, you would be quite worried, especially from the military perspective. Um, and there was one example fairly recently that the US were conducting a, an experiment with drones with about thirty or so drones, and they were given various targets, and they were told what a winner looks like. That you know that when the one that hit all the targets was actually going to be the winner. So what one of the drones did, its AI system actually worked out the best way of actually doing this was to go and kill the host. So it turned around and it actually sped towards the host and did a simulated fire exercise and killed the host. And that's what that's the difficulty that we've actually running into is the control levels, because once the cat is out the bag, the cat is out the bag and there's nothing we can do to, do to stop it. And that brings us to the comment there by Nathan. The big, the big players does concern me. Are we going back to biblical tyranny? What do you mean going back, Nathan? Yeah, yeah. I think Nathan, you're absolutely right here. Um, the problem that we've got is we do not have. I mean, so that's not correct. So the so Westminster. I've got a friend of mine who's a very senior ex McKinsey guy. And he's he together with a lot of very smart people are actually advising the UK government. I've advised the Scottish government um, along the same lines as well. They are thinking Watch about ferries, John. You don't advise in ferries, do you? <laughs> oh, I just thought I'd ask. No, sorry. Probably best not go there, Stuart. It's a little bit controversial. Let's <laughs> say. But the bottom line is, is that government is getting its head around it. There was a, a recent meeting between Rishi Sunak and Joe Biden. And I know for a fact that the biggest thing on the agenda was trying to control AI. 
Um, so Nathan, the big players does concern me as well, because this is building this AI system is out of reach of anybody that's not going to be the meta or the Oracle or the Google or indeed the, or indeed the apples of this world. So we are in essentially looking down the barrels of actually that them taking over the control of our lives rather than actually government doing it. Hi, John, wow. can I can I jump in? Yeah. Hi, it's Kunle. Um, thanks very much for the absolutely petrifying uh, thoughts. Um, <laughs> really, <laughs> really good. A lot of it is actually, you know, just confirms that just how terrifying and realistic Terminator was. But, but just on a, a probably a slightly different level for small business people like us who just, you know, are getting their heads around technology and, and perhaps don't have teenage uh, uh, children to kind of <laughs> help us along the way. What would you say, you know, apart from chat GPT, there's so many of these sort of AI um, apps or, or programs that are out there that can really change the game for us. Um, yeah. Do you have any opinion on anything like that that we, can, you know, we should be looking at? Yeah, so um, let me give you a differential. So Google changed everybody's lives. Um, you know, Google being a search engine. Now think about the app. Now think about the point that actually it's going to be an answer engine. So if you want to know anything, it will tell you. And I've done multiple experiments of this. And ChatGPT is awesomely good. I mean, really just amazing. I wrote a loan letter for somebody fairly recently and handed it to a lawyer friend of mine. He could find no fault with it. So this enables us to do more tasks um, more freely. You know, th there will become a point because I know that Facebook's experimenting with this and so is Apple. But Facebook have actually spent a billion quid on buying a business that's got a, a device that attaches to your wrist that reads brainwaves. So within probably 15 years, there will be a scenario that you won't need a computer anymore because you'll think something and the computer will talk to your brain directly. That massively increases our brain capability as well. So that's why I think the future is actually very positive with this as well. Um, so, I, you know, this and it's all coming into our lives. It's coming in at a rate of knots. I use I, I use chat GPT now probably once or twice a day and I'm now starting to pay for it. So I pay twenty dollars a month for it. And to be frank, it's twenty dollars really, really well spent. Um, so you guys, you know, when you get a problem right on one of your building sites, go and ask chat GPT, play around with it and see what it says. Right, because it's only ever going to get better. So William said, "How do I see the future state running when nobody is working?" Well, <laughs> I don't know the answer to that, and I don't think the politicians know the answer to that as much. Mm -hmm. Will there Here's be a the universal? Problem. Yeah, exactly. Will there be a universal currency handed out to the human race from the big tech companies? I haven't got a fucking clue. Um, my brain is simply not big enough to be able to actually understand the implications of this. You know, I wrote my, the book that I wrote was the, this was the effect on economic policy by technology. But that was nearly 10 years ago now. Right. And it's just changed so dramatically and so much faster that I cannot I can't get my head around how it will actually uh, how it will actually change. I do know a couple of people who are smart enough to have actually worked something out. But they're not saying anything bad about it because I, I think they'll be a little bit, a, a little bit, um, a little bit fried. And yeah, actually, Ready Player One is actually is right on the game there, it's right on the number. Yeah, brilliant. Um, as long as we got a free test, a robot, a robot. Happy. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Okay, any other questions, or will we wrap up at that? I like the free Tesla idea. Not sure that the old Elon will be happy with that, though. <laughs> Excellent. John, that was absolutely brilliant. Thanks for that. Um, absolutely okay. brilliant. Um, thanks for coming along. Scaring the shitless. Um, now we've got to try and get, get back to it. But I think really that uh, I think that the, the big takeaway from tonight is that change is a coming. Yep, absolutely. We'll be sure to invite you back when our robot overlords take over the business, John. <laughs> yes. I'll be sitting on an island actually disconnected from the from the power supplies. <laughs> Many thanks. Cheers, much John, appreciated. Thank you. That's a pleasure. Cheers, Derek. Cheers, Stuart. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. And thank you, everybody, for joining us.